Hello, and welcome to Camp Astro number three. Actually, welcome to my studio after Camp Astro three happened, but I will share photos and time lapses and such from the trip in this video, along with Raymond's and my tips and lessons learned over the last year or so of really getting into astrophotography. Also, members, I made an entire behind the scenes video for you while Raymond and I were at the North Rim of the Grand Canyon. There is a link to it down in the description box. And also there is a link where you can learn how to support this channel by becoming a member. If you're still wondering what Camp Astro is, you can watch the first two sessions. I will share a link to those in the description box as well. But basically Raymond and I go out and camp for at least one night and do astrophotography, typically with a lot of gear, stuff that we own, stuff that I'm borrowing, lots of cameras. Also, like I said, Camp Astro number three was at the North Rim of the Grand Canyon. Instead of camping this time, we actually stayed in some rustic forest service cabins outside of the national park, and we were able to devote two nights to astrophotography right around the new moon. But we also took daytime photos of the canyon. Of course, how could we not? Now, before I hop into the tips and the lessons learned, I wanted to preface this by saying that some of these things will seem obvious to some of you, but hopefully you will take something away from this video, even if it is just enjoying the pretty night skies. I'm going to give you my number one best tip first. Know your camera's controls so that you can use them in the dark because you're gonna be in the dark. <laughs> I realize that you can use a red light headlamp to keep your eyes acclimated to the dark, but I find that if you're with other photographers or if you're doing a time-lapse with one camera while you're taking individual photos with another camera, you are going to end up with red light in some of the images. So know your camera so that you can prevent that as much as possible and you can keep your headlamp off as much as possible. Now, because we use so many different types of cameras, Raymond and I do struggle with this, um, with knowing the buttons on different cameras sometimes. I mean, the menu button is in a different place on every camera, right? But if you know where everything is, it will save you some frustration. Speaking of menus, know how to use the menus in your camera too. If you forget to turn on high ISO noise reduction or something, it will be quick to turn on if you know where the option is. I like the My Menu for this kind of stuff too, or the Favorites menu, depends on the camera. It's handy to also download your camera's manual onto your phone too. Nikon has a manual app, which I adore, but that way, just in case you come across something, you'll be able to look it up. Same goes for your tripod. Know how to make all of the adjustments in the dark by feel alone. Have fresh batteries for your camera, plus extras if you can. We purchased a third-party battery grip for our D810 so that it can have two batteries, or actually double A's because there's a double A battery tray as well. We would like to purchase an AC adapter battery for the Z cameras because we could use them with our solar generator and really not have to think about battery power at all. Set all of the general settings on your camera before you go out. You can approximate things like white balance and shutter speed. You can set your widest aperture. Do you want high ISO noise reduction turned on? things like that. How do you know what your shutter speed might be, you ask? Well, there is a rule of thumb. The calculation for what your shutter speed should be is called the 500 rule, which is 500 divided by your focal length. And that is the slowest shutter speed that you should be able to use and not get star trails. However, Raymond and I tend to go a little bit faster with our shutter speeds for two reasons. One, while using the 500 rule does get you an image that is perfectly acceptable for the creation of a time lapse or for posting images on social media, if you want to be able to zoom into those stars on your computer and pixel people a little bit, you will find that a slightly faster shutter speed will get you those pinprick stars. And then two, these newer cameras do much better at higher ISO sensitivities than cameras of years past. So we can get away with cranking that ISO up a bit. So why not increase your shutter speed so that you get those nice pinprick stars 
Again, though, it's, it's all a balance. So each situation and each camera situation will be different. One setting that I have found incredibly helpful is where the camera will approximate the exposure on your LCD screen so that you can compose your shot. Now you may be saying, don't all cameras have that feature? And they sort of do to an extent. With shutter speeds this slow, without this additional feature, your screen will be pretty much black. On Sony cameras, the option is called bright monitoring. On our Nikon D810, it's called exposure preview. Unfortunately, we have not found the equivalent option on the Nikon Z cameras, which means that to figure out my composition, I have to take the photo, wait for the long exposure, then preview the image before adjusting my camera's position, which is kind of a bummer. Speaking of composition, remember that your tripod isn't stuck to the ground. <laughs> as silly as this sounds, I find myself staying in one place for one reason or another. Like I'm concentrating on the settings or it was dark out, so I wasn't moving around, but make yourself move around to vary your images. Also experiment with your settings a little bit. What happens when you increase the shutter speed or the ISO sensitivity? The worst that can happen is that you waste a few minutes and you have a few extra images on your memory card. Time lapses are awesome. <laughs> They can kind of save an otherwise boring or not ideal situation. For example, if there's clouds in the sky, creating a moving picture can be quite compelling. Camping is our favorite way to do it. We like setting up camp in the middle of nowhere with no one around because we can set our cameras up, preferably right by the tent, and then just have them go all night while we get a little bit of sleep. That being said, it was really nice to stay at the cabins this time. If you are camping, we prefer to camp for more than one night so that we have more than one night to take photos. And also when you're doing time lapses, we can take the lessons learned and apply it to the next night. The interval timer menu feature on the Z cameras is really nice. It has everything you need built right into it your interval time and the number of intervals, but it also has the option to create a new folder and or reset your file numbering. Now those options are not uncommon, but I haven't seen them in the interval timer menu on other cameras that I've used. You just have to go find them elsewhere in the menus, but the options themselves can be very helpful. Using a new folder segregates your time-lapse folder photos from your other photos and resetting the numbering keeps everything in order. Also, I did use a camera recently that once it got to file number 9999, it stopped the time lapse rather than restarting the numbering. And that was a surprise. One thing that is worth mentioning is that every lens is different in terms of focusing distance, where the stars are the smallest points they can be. If you're using the LCD screen on the back of the camera, or if you have an electronic viewfinder, many cameras have the option to zoom in to your focus area. So even when you're using manual focus, you can zoom into an area of the frame. You could theoretically do autofocus on a star, which would get you close, but then you can switch over to manual focus and do that focusing zoom in and rock your focus ring a little back and forth until the star is the smallest point, which is where you want to be. A full spectrum camera with the hydrogen alpha filter is amazing. It's by no means necessary, but it really is interesting what you get out of it. When this video goes up, I'm not sure if I'll have my video about the HA filter done, but when I do, I will link to it below. For now, I will link to my video on our full spectrum camera and also to that specific filter too. But know that if you are an avid astrophotographer, look into it, it's worth it. And last, my second best tip for astrophotography. You've heard me mention timing, light, and location often on this channel in regard to being the most important settings for photography. Astrophotography is no exception. Shooting right around the new moon, having dark skies, and being at high elevation are all things that will amplify your astrophotography. So the next Camp Astro is kind of the ultimate Camp Astro. It is in Yellowknife, Canada, where I am co-leading a photography tour. It begins next week. Speaking of which, for all of you headed out on that tour with me, make sure that you have seen all three videos that I made for you. If you haven't seen my emails with the links, let me know. 
And for all members, remember there is a link in the description to the behind the scenes antics from this trip. Check it out. And for everyone, thank you for watching.